Hi, everyone. So machine learning has been a pretty big buzzword for the last few years. But it has been applied to pretty much everything. But it hasn't really been applied to games that much. So today, I'm going to talk about how to enhance your game's AI using machine learning agents. Um, I'm from Unity. My name is Alessia, and I'm a technical evangelist. So machine learning agents, what are they? This is one example that if you've seen machine learning agents before, you've probably seen these two examples before. Uh, the first one is a ball that you have to balance on top of a platform. And this is done with 15 seconds of training, approximately. Uh, the second one is an example of a character that has to push a crate outside of an arena. And this is another example that is more recent. It's from GDC. And it's done using imitation learning. So on the left side, we have the human character. On the right side, we have the agent. And they pretty much work the same way. So the agent is smart enough, uh, but not too smart so that you can't beat it. So it's a good level of smart. So there's been pretty much a lot of content about machine learning agents pretty much everywhere on the internet. So we have the Unity blogs where we released a lot of content tutorials and how to get started with it. And there's also dev content, so you can find a lot of resources on GitHub as well. But in case you haven't heard of it, so this is a really quick introduction on machine learning. So machine learning is an application of artificial intelligence that is aimed on automating a system to do something without us having to tell it exactly how to do it. So the first two versions of machine learning agents, so far there's three out. The first two use reinforcement learning, which is down there in green. And what it basically is, to give a concrete example, is basically say that we have a pet, we have a dog, and we want to teach it to do a trick or something. Uh, we're just going to give a treat if it does the right thing. So the same way machine learning reinforcement learning algorithms are based on the concept of reward and punishment. So we're going to get the agent to act completely randomly. And then if it does the right thing, we're going to provide a reward. If it does the wrong thing, then we're going to provide a punishment. So this is made possible thanks to neural networks that work in Unity under the hood. So we don't need to worry about it. And the third version of machine learning agents, version 0.3, the one that came out last month, is imitation learning. So what this means is that instead of reinforcement learning that was a different kind, now we have a student and a teacher in a scene. And the student is basically going to copy whatever the teacher does. And it's going to learn according to what the teacher is doing. In this case, the teacher is going to be the human player. So we are going to be teaching the student what it has to do. So let's take a look at how this works in Unity. We have a Unity scene that contains an academy game object. So this is a game object that has a, an academy script attached to it. And everything that happens in this academy script is that we set up all different settings for the training. So we have, for example, the time scale, the, the frame rate, the quality of the level. And then these informations are passed onto the brains. So the brains are where the decision actually happens. So there's four different kinds of brains. We have internal, external, heuristic, and there is a fourth type that is not there, but it's the player. And that's what we're going to need in the case of imitation learning. So all the information that the brains uh, process are passed onto the agents, which are other game objects in the scene. And they are what we're basically going to train. So each agent has an agent script attached to them. And we are going to script what happens in there. And what we basically do is we tell the agent what our final goal is, but we don't tell the agent how we want to achieve this. So we just let it act. And then we provide reward and punishment. So this Unity scene uh, communicates with the external Python environment through TensorFlow. And everything is handled under the hood. So again, we don't need to worry about it. So why do we want to use AI in games? There's many reasons for this. 
The first reason is that it can be sometimes difficult and complex and time-consuming to program our own AI, but at the same time, it makes the games a lot more fun to play. Another reason is that the development is made a lot easier. So there is this milestone that we need to get over, which is programming our AI, but after that, the development after is made a lot easier. And then another reason is that it saves time on scripting. So, for example, if we were to script our own AI, we would have to program every single edge case. While if we use machine learning, we just let the machine learn what it's right to do in every situation. So we don't need to script the edge, case, edge cases. So this is one example that you might have seen before. It's Mario, and it's where I took inspiration from my demo in this case. Um, this uses neural evolution and genetic algorithms. I'm not going to explain what they are in detail, but what you basically need to know is that this is not a human player playing, but it's been figured out by the machine. So it's possible to do something similar in Unity. It's possible to obtain kind of the same results, not using, neural, uh, not using genetic algorithms, but using imitation learning. So I'm just going to show you how this is going to work. First of all, the, the system is going to learn by watching us play, and then it's going to adjust to the player. Then it's also a more organic approach than scripting, because in this case, we consider the environment as a whole. So we don't have to worry about the edge cases. We don't have to script the agent without it being aware of what's happening outside. And another important thing is that we don't want it to be perfect. Because when we script AI and we just program it, then it's always very predictable. So we know exactly what the AI is going to do at any given point. While in this case, it's like we actually have a person that is trying to copy what we're trying to do. So it never, it's never going to happen that it's exactly the same as it should be. So it's never going to be completely perfect. It's going to be imperfect, which is what we want to obtain in this case. And another really exciting thing is that in uh, Unity um, machine learning agents, imitation learning happens in real time. So we perform the training while we're playing as the teacher. So in this demo, I'm going to apply machine learning agents in an existing game. And what I want to focus on here is that I am going to do it on a game that it's already been completed because I want to show how it's possible to introduce machine learning agents into your already finished game. But it's not necessary to wait until the end to implement them. You can do it at any given time. So yeah, it's an existing game. So this is the game that I'm going to use. You might have seen it before if you've been on the Unity blogs. So this is the 2D game kit. It came out a few weeks ago, and it's a game that we released on the Asset Store. And what it basically is is a set of assets, tools, scripts that you can take, uh, put every single, take every single asset and put it into your game, and it's going to help you develop a new scene. So before we dive into it, let's break down what we need to do. First of all, we have a task. So we want to take an inspiration from uh, Mario. We want to automate the movement. So we want the agent to go from one side to the level to another side. For the sake of this demo, I'm not going to go to the end of the level, so I'm going to make the training faster so that I'm just going to show a part of the level. So this is the first thing that we want to do. Second thing is we want it to act smartly. So this means that, for example, when we have a platform and we are walking towards a level, um, at the point of the platform, we want to be able to jump. And of course, we could just always continuously jump, because at some point, we're going to overcome the platform. But a player wouldn't play like that. A player would just wait till it gets to the platform and then jump. So this is one thing that we want to keep into account. Also, we need to remember that the training duration depends on the complexity of the task. So in this case, I'm just going to make something really easy, which is when we get to a platform, then we want to jump. 
and we don't need to, to worry about other options, other controls like crouching or uh, sprinting, but it's something that you can implement if you want. Also, if you want to increase the complexity of your task and you don't want to make the training incredibly long, like overnight, you can use curriculum learning, which means that you basically tell the agent that once it gets to a certain point, a certain quality of the, of the system, then you can increase the complexity and then change the level, maybe. And there is a lot online about this. I'm not going to go too much into this because I didn't use it in this demo, but it's in the Unity blogs and there's plenty of documentation. And then another important thing, just remember that you need to know what you're trying to achieve. So you can't just uh, start from scratch and on the fly you're going to decide what you're going to create. So this is the final product. Again, it's not perfect because we don't want it to be perfect. But this is basically trained in real time. So I'm playing as a teacher, and then this is the result. And I also wanted to focus on how I'm changing the scene in real time. So I press play, and then using our time map system, I change what's happening in the scene. And the agent will understand that it's in front of a different situation. So it's going to start trying to overcome the platform in this case. So getting ready for the training. So what are the things that we need to do in the engine? First of all, we need to be aware of what vector observations are. So these are all the variables, all the values in the game that the agent needs to be aware of. So in this case, what I do is I cast a ray in front of me, in front of the agent, and if the ray meets a platform, then in that case I know that the agent will have to jump. So the agent is always aware of whether it has to jump or not. Second thing we need to be aware of is vector actions. So they are all the possible actions that the agent can perform, and this is within the training and also the, the testing, so within the engine. So in my case, my agent is able to go back, so go left, go right, or jump. And I also have one extra action, which is the default action, which means to just stand still. Also, we have teacher and student. So they are both agents, and they act in a different way. So that means that we need to give two different brains to them. We need to associate their agent script to a different, a different brain, because the decisions that they make are going to be different. And then the broadcasting feature. So this is just a, a checkbox that we need to activate when we are in the teacher script. And that means that all the actions that we perform while we're playing will be broadcasted to the student. So let's take a look at this in the demo. So this is the 2D game kit. I simply downloaded it from the asset store and I opened the first scene. So this is called Zone 1. All the information about the level, all the game objects are under level here. And this is all stuff that I'm not going to change at all. So I just put it in a separate game object. These are everything, all the assets that are important for me for the sake of this demo. So first of all, we have the cameras. You know what the cameras are. Um, we have two agents. So we have our teacher, which is the character that I'm going to play. And we have the student, which is what is going to copy. And then we have all the machine learning assets. So first of all, we have the academy, which is what I told you about. And it has an academy script attached to it. And it has different variables that we can change, that we can customize. So first of all, we have max step. If I over on it, it's going to tell you all the information about it. But what it basically is, is that we set a number. And if the training reaches that number, that number of steps, then it will reset. So remember that one step is not one frame, but one physics frame. So it runs in fixed update. Then we have training configuration, which is all the information that we want for the training to happen. So 
width uh, height of the window of the training. So it's very, very basic stuff. And then we have the same in the inference. Now we have the brains that are children of the academy. So what they are, first of all, I'm going to go into the teacher brain. And I'm going to close brain parameters for now. I'm going to explain to you what they are later. But first of all, we have brain type, which in this case, as I said, it's player, which means that once we go into the training, we're going to be the one playing as the teacher. And then we have the broadcast checkbox, and it ticked. It's ticked. Uh, and then we have the default action, which is, in this case, zero, and that means just stand still, nothing happens. And all the different actions that you can perform as a player. So you have D, so go right, go left, and, and jump. So the brain parameters, what they are, are they, they are the vector observation that I was talking about. So this can be discrete or continuous. I'm going to explain what it is later. Uh, the space size and stack vectors, all the information about these, again, if you hover on the variable, it's going to explain you what it is. Then we also have visual observation, and I will explain these at the end, and vector actions, which is the actions that the agent can perform. And in this case, they are four, because as we said, stand still, left, right, and jump. Then we have a second brain, and this is the student brain. So brain parameters are the same. And the brain type, in this case, we want to set it as external. So as I said, there are four different types. The player is the one that we need for the teacher. And the external means that we are going to pass the information. And we're, we're basically going to say the training and the responsibilities of this game object is going to be passed to Python externally. So we don't have to worry about it. Then we have the teacher agent and the student agent. So the teacher agent has the agent script attached to it, and the first variable is the brain. So we're going to have to link this agent script to a brain. In this case, it's going to be the teacher. Then all the other variables are basically settings on the max steps, which is the same thing that was in the academy, but on the agent side. So we might want to reset the agent, but not reset the academy. And then we have reset on done. I'll show you this in code in a second. And then on demand decisions and decision frequency. Uh, this means that you don't actually make any decision every frame if you want, but you can make them at certain intervals and you can choose the frequency. And this would be really useful for, for example, turn based games. Everything after that is very agent specific. Um, so demo-specific variables. So in this case, I'm connecting the agent to the actual teacher. So from here. And then the goal, which is when I want to say, at this point, the academy has to restart. And then I also have this other uh, script that is basically just a helper to say, if you use this, then at runtime, you have more power to, for example, record what you're broadcasting or reset. And then again, we have another script that is for the student, and it's connected to the student brain. Everything else, as I said, this is the goal. And you can see it from the scene. It's, I don't know if you can see it from that screen, but it's basically just a collider, a trigger, that says once you enter that trigger area, then it, it restarts. So going back to the presentation, let's go talk about the script. So the script has different uh, functions that are already there, but you just need to expand, expand them and implement them. So the initialize agent script function is exactly what it says it does. So it runs only one time, and it's everything that you want to do to initialize your agent script. Then you have collect observations, which is basically what you can have when, um, when you want to collect all the, the states, all the things that the agent is aware of. Then we have the uh, agent action, which is all the behavior of the, of the agent itself. 
So everything that the agent can do, um, whether it's in the training or in the testing, it's going to be stored here. And this is also where you say when you want to reward the agent. And then we have the agent reset and the agent undone. They work pretty much the same way. So they are run whenever we decide to reset the agent. So let's see this in code. So I'm going to open my agent script. So here we have the initialize agent function. So this is basically just telling us that we are, well, they're, they're just the variables that we want to initialize at the beginning. So we want to save the initial position so that once we reset, our agent is able to go back to the beginning. Then we have collect observation. And this is where we need to save all the information that are interesting for the agent that it needs to be aware of. And we have has platform in front. So this is simply array casting that I, I wrote in this same uh, script. And that returns a float, one or zero, and the agent will be able to associate whether it has a platform in front or not to the actions that it's performing. Then we have agent action. So first of all, I check if the agent is grounded. This is not something that I want the machine learning agents to control, because normally if I was playing as a player, I wouldn't be able to control that. So I would only be able to move if I'm grounded. And these, is our, these are the actions. So this is basically what is passed from the neural network. And the character can either move um, right, left, or jump. I didn't add zero because nothing happens when you press zero. And then we have the goal, which is basically saying that at this point, once we enter the checkpoint, we just want to set done. And we add the reward so that we basically push the agent to, to keep walking. And then agent reset or agent undone. There's basically two of them because you have the possibility, if you go onto the, sorry. If you go into the, I believe it's the agent script, yes, you have reset undone. And if you tick this checkbox, it, uh, it basically means that whenever it's done, whenever you call the function done, then agent reset is called. So I'm basically just resetting the position. So the learning process. So the way this works, at this point, we're just going to um, to pass all the responsibility to Python. And to do this, we need to do some preparation, and then we can take the script and just pass it outside. So first of all, we set the student brain type to external, which we've already done. We are going to need to set it back to internal once we import the model back. Then we build the scene. Then we have the possibility to fine tune the keeper parameters if we want. This is not something that you have to do. Uh, there is a lot of different uh, hyperparameters already set there for you, and they are already uh, in the trainer config.yaml file. You can simply just call your brain as the name of the brain that is in the file, and it's automatically going to take all the hyperparameters there in there. And then you can launch the training just via terminal window. So you don't need to install anything apart from Python. And then you start playing. So you start teaching your student agent. So let's see how to do that. So I just go back to my demo. I make sure that my student brain is set to external. And then I build, so simply File, build settings, and then I just build the zone that I, that I want to build in this case. So I've already done that, so I'm just going to go straight to the terminal. At this point, you need to navigate to the Python folder that is in your Unity project. 
So when you download machine learning agents from the GitHub repository, because at the moment it's just in beta, so you can find it on GitHub. Uh, once you download it, it's going to download for you also this Python folder, which you put in your environment, just outside the assets folder. And then you navigate to that. And at that point, you uh, run python3 learn.py file. And then you write the name of your environment. So you need to remember what the build is called. And then you run train. And you run it slow so that you're able to play at the same time. So this is going to run my game. At the same time, we're going to have a lot of information about the brain itself. So these are all the parameters that you can set. And you should be able to do it from the YAML file. And it also tells you the information about the academy. In this case, it's telling me that it started successfully. So this is the game. And I can, I don't know if you can see the teacher, because I made sure to make it a bit transparent so that it doesn't, uh, is not confused with the, with the student. But my student is already starting to play. So it's kind of learning what I'm doing at this point. It's still slower than me, and it's supposed to be because it's still learning. So now I get to the collider area, and I restart. And now the student is actually being faster than me. So it's already learned something. It's not the best yet, but it's already getting to the end without me getting to the end. So I'm going to go there. And I'm going to train for like 25 seconds, and we're just going to see how it performs. So I'm simply playing as I would if I were a normal player. I run it one more time, and then we see the result. So now at this point, I can close the training with Control c and this is going to freeze all the parameters that I got from this training. And what I can do now is I navigate to the Python folder, which I have here. And then there is a folder called models with PPO. And then the name of my build, underscore PPO.bytes. So it's a byte file. It's something that if we open, of course, we can't read. I'm just going to take this and drag it onto my game scene, onto my project files. And then this is my file, my trained model. So we haven't trained it for that long, so it's not going to be perfect. But I'm just going to take my student brain, set it back to internal. And then I'm going to drag this model to graph model. So we don't need to worry about the variables here. Everything that we need to worry about is graph model. We replace it with our current model. And then we press play. And it's not recognizing immediately what to do. It can do it with a bit of help. So now it's going to start going through the level by itself. And another thing that I wanted to do at this point is I'm going to use our tile map to change the environment in real time. So I'm going to press play and remove some of the tiles while the agent is going around. Don't know how well you're able to see this, but. So and I start removing some tiles. Maybe I can make it harder for the agent so that it's not able to jump. And then as soon as there is two tiles that it can jump, then it's going to start learning when it's the right time to jump. So I can also do the opposite using a root tile, which means that it's going to reconstruct the environment automatically. So if I make it really hard for the agent, for example, at this point, it's not able to. But if I make it jump, I make it able to jump, then it's going to be able to go through the level and then to get to the end. So 
So this is the, the demo itself. Um, there are some useful tips that I didn't cover here, but I'm just going to give you a quick overview of them. So if you want to make the most of machine learning agents, there are a lot of different features that you can use. One of them is on-demand decisions. So if you're working on a turn-based game, like a card game, for example, and you don't want your agent to make a decision for each frame, then you can use on-demand decisions. As I said, you can set the frequency yourself. Right now, the way it works is that uh, agent step, um, agent action, because we, we changed the name recently, uh, the function where all the behavior of the agent actually happens runs in fixed update. So that means that it runs every single frame, physics frame. Then we also have visual observations. So in addition to all the vector observations, which are basically what the agent is aware of every, all the time during the training, we can also add visual observations, which means that you can take a camera and you can set up the agent to be able to see whatever that camera sees. So this is another very useful feature that you can use. And it's just as simple as adding a new camera. I'm actually just going to show you within the engine. So if you want to use that, you can go to the student brain, and you have visual observations here. If you open it, you can add new cameras. And you can set up also the, the resolution for the, for the camera. Of course, the least pixels you have, the less pixels you have in the camera, the faster the training is going to go. Of course, always remember to not consider all the details that you don't need for the training. Because in this case, it was a really simple demo. So it was really fast to train and have some results. But normally, it would take longer, because the neural network has to iterate over and over. This can also be done from, for each agent. So for in the agent script, you have agent cameras here. And you can simply add the camera and then drag a camera from your hierarchy or remove the camera in case you don't need it. So this is visual observations. We also have continuous and discrete space. So I was telling you about this. I said that I would talk about it later. I didn't forget. So we have continuous and discrete observations, which means that depending on the kind of um, precision of accuracy that we need for our training, we can use different kinds of spaces. So discrete means that we're only going to use integer numbers. So in my case, I'm using discrete actions and discrete uh, observations as well, because my only observation is whether there is a platform in front of the agent or not. And if there is a platform, then it's one. If there is no platform, then it's zero. Um, for continuous, it means that maybe we want uh, some more precision. For example, in the demo that I showed at the beginning of the, the car, the hovering car that is floating around, uh, in that case, we want to know exactly how much we're, uh, we're stirring or how much we're uh, tilting. So in that case, we need to use continuous observations. The same way we're using discrete actions in this case, because we only have zero, which means that we stand still. We have one, that means we go right, left, and space. So they're simple buttons pressed. We don't need to know for how long that button has been pressed. Also, regarding vector observations, it's always very useful. It's just a, a quick tip. It's very useful to. Um, make sure that it's normalized and it's between minus one and plus one, because that is, if it's not, it's going to confuse the neural network. And then we also have a new feature with um, machine learning agents uh, version 0.3, and it's that you're able to use recurrent neural networks. So if you're doing a simulation where you need your agent to remember something in particular, so a memory-enhanced environment, you can use recurrent neural networks as well. There's also other machine learning method, methods that I didn't cover in this presentation, but I was talking about them at the beginning. So for the very first version of machine learning, 
we used reinforcement learning. So as I mentioned, this is based on the concept of reward and punishment. And there is plenty of resources to get started with this. So you can just Google machine, machine learning agents beginner's guide. And it's a blog post that I wrote, and it's on the Unity blogs. And it's basically a very quick tutorial on how to get started, how to use them if you have never done, have never worked with machine learning agents before. And then there's also a talk that I gave at DevGam Minsk um, in November. And you can just find it on YouTube by writing Unity Real Brain. It should be the first result. Uh, I'm not putting links because I know that otherwise you need to take photos and it's going to be long. Um, for the second version of machine learning agents, we released curriculum learning, as I mentioned. And there's some information on these on the Unity blogs again. And you can just Google Unity blog curriculum learning. Should be the first result again. So one thing that I was about to forget, um, many times it, I get asked why, when you should use reinforcement learning rather than imitation learning. Like, what are the advantages of one rather than the other? And it's very useful. Well, it depends. Most of the times, it, it depends on the situation and on the kind of simulation that you're trying to do. Um, I think that you should use reinforcement learning more when you want the agent to learn some set of rules rather than, a, uh, rather than something that is always going to be the same. So if you want the agent, for example, to uh, know that whenever it gets to a certain point and it finds some certain conditions, it has to do that, then reinforcement learning is probably the most efficient method for that. Uh, otherwise, machine learning, um, imitation learning, sorry, it's going to be better if you have to copy exactly what's, what's happening. So these are the difference between reinforcement learning and imitation learning. Curriculum learning actually falls under reinforcement learning. It's just a way of improving how this is working. And then some more resources. Um, we have the machine learning agents repository. So this is where you can get the machine learning agents right now. Uh, normally, you should be able to get it at some point from the asset store. So this will be integrated. Right now, it's just a beta. Um, but you will be able to, to get it later from that. And then the Unity blogs is where we post all the updates. There's also a part of the website that is fully dedicated to artificial intelligence and everything that we're working on right now. And if you want any further resources, you can just ping me on Twitter. So this is everything for me. And there is a link at the end of this slide. And it's basically to get some feedback. And also, uh, we're going to have a prize draw in about a week. We're going to pick one person that has filled the form. And we're going to send t-shirts and other swag, uh, notepads, and stress balls. So this is everything from me. Uh, I'm open to any questions. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I didn't quite understood how the integration with TensorFlow is done. This internal, external uh, Dropbox you showed. Uh, is it possible to run the game in the Unity player without TensorFlow? Um, you need a TensorFlow Sharp plugin. Uh, that it's actually in, in so my project is, folder. So is uh, Python? actually should be running inside uh, like mobile device if I'm making a game from a mobile phone? Um, I'm not sure if after the build, after the build you should be able to, to run this even if Python is not there. So everything that this build model is, once you pass it onto the engine, it's just a dot bytes file. So it's a series of zero and ones. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't need to, to have Python installed on the mobile. OK, so this an internal type of the agent, as I understood, this is yeah. completely implemented inside Unity without Python, without TensorFlow, yeah. right? Uh, then is it, does it support all the features of the TensorFlow? For example, if I configure some very fancy neural net network using TensorFlow features, will this internal Unity implementation uh, be able to run it the same way? 
So this or, is or it's some limited number of features implemented. Okay. So as far as I know, this is not supported for expansions yet because it's still in a beta. But all the code is available. Um, there is actually in the previous two versions, it used to be a Jupyter notebook. So you were able to see the code itself. Right now, they made it easier so that it's not necessary for you to go through the Python code, and you can simply run it from, from the command prompt, from the terminal. Uh, can you for a second open the file of the configuration of the neural network, yes. the Python file? So the hyperparameters file. Yep. Yeah. So. It's on under Python and trainer config. And this is mm -hmm. all the hyperparameters. I'm going to zoom in. All the hyperparameters that are there as default. So you have the default that is everything that runs in the case in which your um, brain doesn't match. The name of the brain doesn't match anything that is here. So here, there's just different kind of names that depend. They're not completely random, I swear. Um, they actually come from the um, uh, demos that are in the machine learning agents repository. So there is one demo for each one of these, these kind of brains, and they all act in different ways. And this uh, YAML file is Unity specific or TensorFlow specific? Um, I think it would be on TensorFlow. I'm not sure about this. So if I would want to make another kind of external backend, it will have different kind of configuration file. What do you or, mean, sorry? Like, uh, like theoretically, uh, TensorFlow will probably in the future be not the only one external yeah. uh, backend for neural networks. So will it have a different kind of configuration? So different hyperparameters as well. OK, so Unity will have to implement the same uh, algorithms which TensorFlow has, like everything, yeah. or maybe only partly? Uh, it depends on how it works on the back end. So if uh, there is a way of making it common for all the different kind of neural network training um, algorithms, then it's possible. So it depends on that. OK, cool. Thanks. Thank you. It, any more questions? Uh, oh, yeah. Hi, uh, I have a question. Uh, can I change the uh, training function inside this file? Sorry, the training? The training function inside the neural network. So no. you're talking about the, the neural network function itself? Yes, yes. The training function and uh, the export functions and so on. So can you, you can access it, as I said, uh, from the Jupyter Notebook. Mm -hmm. um, it's not supported, so it's the way it's basically made is that you don't have to worry about anything that happens within the neural network itself. So as a developer, you just go into the engine, write down, code your behavior, the behavior of your agents, mm -hmm. and you can just go and you have your machine learning agents working. So everything that you change from the back end, it, at that point, becomes your responsibility. So okay. yeah. OK, thanks. Hi, thanks for a good talk. Hi. Uh, my question is that you mentioned that uh, machine learning can be used to speed up development, but have you actually like, measured it? Because I've also seen plenty of examples where these uh, self-learning agents find like the worst exploits in your game and then use those to beat your game very fast. Mm. Sorry, what's the question? <laughs> so does it really uh, speed up your game development, or does it mean that you really have to uh, find every error in your games Well, that human wouldn't find. OK. Yeah, the, the way that I, what I mean when I say it speeds up the development is that when you are coding your own AI, most of the times you have to say, if it gets to that point of the room where nobody has ever gotten and you're not supposed to, then some certain things have to happen. So it's all the edge cases that you would normally have to consider if you are making anyone play your game, because gamers normally just try and break the game as much as they can. So if you want to uh, be able to not have to code all that behavior, then you can simply use machine learning agents. And the agent will be able to recognize when it's in a certain situation. Of course, if you make it able to by setting up the right vector observations, 
So if the agent is aware of where it is in the space every time for every fixed, fixed update, then it will be able to know how to react for each situation. So what I mean when I say speeding up the development is that you don't have to code all the edge cases. So it should make it faster for you. Does he answer your question? Do you want to? Yeah? OK. Any, any more questions? Oh, yeah, here, here's one. OK. Uh, nice talk <laughs> also. Uh, the question is about the performance. Um, if you use uh, ML agents, how much uh, performance and where you should uh, see the difference uh, when compared to the fake AI we used to before, like for scripting and stuff? So in terms of performance, machine learning agents doesn't actually consume more than just coding your game normally. Because everything that happens in terms of training happens outside of Unity. So you train your neural network in Python, and then everything that the neural network outputs is a bytes file. So you take that, you put it back into, into Unity, and that's everything that changed into, in, in your game. So in terms of performance, there's no actual difference. OK, so the reading, basically, reading already existing by file won't have noticeable difference compared to the fake, uh, fake AI, which you usually would script by. Depends on how the, the fake AI yes. is, is coded, yeah. Uh, and the other question is, uh, if uh, somebody plans to create uh, a game which is moddable in the future, uh, is it possible um, easily to uh, do it this way that you can uh, let the end users mod the AI? Yeah, this is one of the things that we get asked the most. Um, I think it would be really cool if it was possible for the agent to be trained by the player. At the moment, it's not. It's not supported. But I think that the team is trying to gather as many use cases as possible so that if there is enough requests, then they're going to implement that feature. Of course, there is, there is a lot to work on, but this is not available yet. Thank you. Thank you. But, uh you answered the question I had in mind. Uh, if I'm going to teach uh, like in uh, bots in in the modern action game, y there is no way to do it uh, so far without uh, without training it by uh, developers uh, themselves in in studio. I mean, you cannot use any recordings from the uh, player sessions. Uh, currently, it's not implemented. Or maybe I I can do some trick. You know. Is, is there any way to, to use recorded uh, user sessions to, to teach my, my model? Um, there would be hacks to do that. So there would be ways that if you work on it, um, you could be able to save the user inputs through, uh, because everything that you take as an input when you're playing, everything that the agent actually knows is some integer numbers, so some values. So if you are able to record those values and then you reproduce them into the agent training back from the side of the engine, then you're able to, to train so in that I, way. I, I can, I can, yeah, yeah. So I can record uh, these sessions with a, with a proper way and then feed them back. In, in yeah. On. Okay. yeah. That, that works for me. Thank you. Thank you.